My name is Chris Reeves, and I am a fellow of Odd Salon, sheltering in place in the mighty state of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. This is John Early, world famous leper. How an ornery leper scared America's wealthy into funding medical research. It's June 2nd, 1914. You're a news reporter for the Washington Post. You walk into the fashionable Shoreham Hotel in Washington, D.C. to respond to an anonymous tip for a story. You and two other reporters arrive at a hotel room and are greeted by a tall, well-spoken man. This man. He shakes everyone's hands and says, You have just shaken hands with a leper. One reporter just bursts into tears. You start shaking. The scene devolves into utter chaos. Who is this man? It's John Early, world-famous leper. But first, leprosy. Leprosy has been feared for thousands of years. Arabic scholars describe a specific medical condition, naming it Judim. But while translating medical texts into Latin, one Christian monk decided to use the term lepra from the Bible, <clears throat> which was a catch-all for any disease that causes open sores, rashes, lack of feeling, and or deformed or missing body parts. The problem is that lots of other diseases have these symptoms. Missing facial parts in particular are also a symptom of syphilis, which one caught from too much sexy time. A single, lazy editor made leprosy a sin. Visible symptoms of the disease cause victims to be stigmatized as unclean and unworthy of God. Most often, they were exiled or shunned completely. Now, in order to preserve their dignity, I will not be showing you photos of real people who suffered from this disease. Leprosy causes deadened nerves, blindness, loss of extremities when they become damaged and get secondary infections. The fear and stigma over leprosy was so strong that people were often treated as if they were already dead. In some places, spouses were granted summary divorces, and the patient's will was immediately executed before the person was exiled. Known lepers were hunted down by law enforcement and shipped to leper colonies in empty boxcars. One man was shipped back and forth between counties who refused to accept him for two weeks before a doctor finally entered the car to find that the man had been dead for days. In 1875, a Norwegian physician named Gerhard Hansen isolated the bacterium that causes leprosy. The disease was renamed Hansen's disease, but the stigma still stuck. Hansen's disease is easily treated today with three or four antibiotics. In the early 2000s, two genes were discovered that contribute to a predisposition to infection by Hansen's disease. Only 5% of the human population seems to have these genes. 95% are naturally immune to Hansen's disease, but Hawaiians and the French tend to have the genes to catch it. <clears throat> Even if you have these genes, a Hansen's disease is super hard to contract. We do have current cases of Hansen's disease in the southern United States because of the prevalence of French genes in the Creole population, and they catch it from the only other mammal who is affected by Hansen's disease armadillos. Witness the horror of a live leper! <laughs> the CDC website actually states, for general health reasons, avoid contact with armadillos whenever possible. Leprosy was a disease that brought out the worst in politicians, whose reactions were to get rid of the person by forced exile to leper colonies, which were effectively prisons. But Taking care of exiles costs a lot of money. The conditions alone in many leper colonies were often life-threatening. Early exiles to the colony on the island of Molokai were originally pushed off the side of a ship. Even if they made it to shore, they were only given a small blanket to sleep on and were made to sleep outside on the ground. But as long as they were out of sight, no one would know. Leprosy was known to be one of the least contagious diseases, yet it remained an illegal disease, warranting complete segregation for no reason other than politicians 
giving in to the stigma of public fear. In 1908, <clears throat> retired Army Corporal John Early goes to the VA hospital in Washington, D.C. to have a doctor look at burns that he sustained while working at a paper mill. He jokingly asks, do you think I have leprosy? The doctor does. A second doctor concurs, and Early is immediately quarantined. He is moved to a tent along the banks of the Potomac behind several fences and under armed guard. John's wife, Lottie, and young son come from their home in North Carolina to see him. Lottie is told to choose between her husband and her son. Meanwhile, public spectators line up six deep along the fences just to be disappointed by the sight of an ordinary looking man in his 30s. John is kept in a tent for several months, and his family is only allowed to visit for one hour each day. Here is a picture of them sitting about six feet apart. Eventually, authorities moved John and Lottie into an abandoned home in D.C. where a brick wall is constructed between two portions of the house and an armed officer enforces their separation. John and Lottie sing to each other from their side of the wall at night. After almost a year of quarantine, a curious thing happens. John's leprosy clears up. In order to confirm that John is free of the disease, he will have to be tested in New York, where doctors have hotly contested his prognosis. But no one wants John in their town. He can't go back home. Not to move leper. Leper not to be deported. Won't send leper here. May yet send leper here. Alleged leper sent me here in a boxcar. John tests negative for the disease and is released. Under assumed names, John and Lottie move to Brooklyn, to Connecticut, to Los Angeles, and finally to Washington State, but their identities are always discovered and they are driven out of each community in turn. Then, John's leprosy comes back. Lottie is now 22 years old with two children and has been on the run for five years across five states since she was 17. She's had enough. John has become abusive. So Lottie secretly cuts off a piece of John's tissue and sends it to Dr. Hansen himself, who confirms that John has a mild form of the disease with lesions that come and go. John is sent to a leper colony in Tacoma and Lottie marries another man. John loses his shit. He hires someone in a failed attempt to kill Lottie and then John disappears. In this time, John has an epiphany. He realizes that Lottie is not to blame, but instead that his troubles arise from the cruelty towards people who suffer from Hansen's disease. So John makes a plan. Which brings us back to the Shoreham Hotel. This is where you come in. John shakes your hand, tells you he's a leper, and says, I called you newspaper man up to my room so that you would write stories about me. For the last two weeks, John has been on tour. He spent his pension on a first-class train ticket, stopping in Toronto, New York City, and finally Washington, D.C. He's been to Broadway shows, a baseball doubleheader, fancy restaurants, and has stayed in the very best hotels, like the Shoreham, which is home to the vice president and several senators. He says, to demonstrate how easy it is for a leper to mingle in cities, I planned my present trip six months ago. I knew that it is only when a great truth is set home to the hearts of the people that attention is paid to it. I knew that if I mingled among the well-to-do and the rich and exposed them to contagion, that they would arise out of self-protection and further my plan of a national home. Leper is a derogatory term, but... John wears it like a badge. He has the sympathy of the public and he knows how to use it against politicians that continue to ignore the cruel treatment of people with Hansen's disease. John is white, male, an army veteran, and has a form of the disease that does not leave him disfigured. He is working his privilege and he knows it. He publicly insists that a hospital is needed to care for people with Hansen's disease as patients 
not as criminals. This same day, the issue of a federal leper hospital comes up in Congress. A bill is approved, and John is sent, forcibly, to live at the Louisiana leper home near Carville, which is chosen as the site for the new national hospital. The home is in disrepair. The home is in a swamp. After a while, Congress has dragged their feet on approving money to redevelop the hospital and make good on their promise to properly care for the patients. So... John Early escapes again, and again, and again, and again. Each time, he shows up to congressional meetings announcing himself as John Early, the leper. John's antics win both the money and public sentiment to improve the care of people with Hansen's disease. The Louisiana Leper Home is developed into a state-of-the-art hospital and quickly becomes the world's leading research facility for patients with Hansen's disease. John attends the dedication ceremony of the new hospital where he delivers several choice words about Congress. John lives the rest of his life at Carville where he is treated for symptoms of PTSD and he continues to advocate for Hansen's disease patients through writing, by escaping, and by generally being a dick. The Washington Post writes, his eccentricities have at least served to keep the public apprised of the fact that there is a leprosy problem in the United States. John later writes a 48-page memoir outlining the injustices of man. It is titled, John Early, World Famous Leper. So, audience, friends, lend me your glass. Here's to using your privilege to harass, harry, and harangue those who would oppress the less fortunate.